Well, good evening, everyone. Hi, Here we are in another music connection. In, in uh, Groundhog Day. Groundhog 100, Day. 150, I think. We are binging, friends. Oh, we are gosh. binging this week. So we're very excited tonight. We are indeed. And folks, our, our guest tonight is... I'm gonna, I, I had to write some notes here because I to make sure I got everything in here. You know, our guest is a is a broadcaster, a professional musician, and a, a teacher and a lecturer, and uh, he's the host of the national syndicated radio program Center Stage from Wolf Trap, and he currently announces for Classical WETA FM in Washington. He's a former broadcaster that might be familiar to many of you, certainly uh, international audiences, uh, for Voices, uh, Voice of America and the Maestro Classical Musical Channel of the World Space Satellite Network. And on stage, he hosts the chamber music series in the barns at Wolf Trap and at the City of Fairfax Band. He also presents pre-conference talks for the National Symphony Orchestra. And for 15, uh, 13 years, um, he was a saxophone soloist and the MC with the U.S. Army Band, Go Army. Um, and uh, he's also a founding member of the Washington Saxophone Quartet. And here's a little tidbit for you that I just love. Uh, if you've ever listened to All, All Things Considered on NPR, you've heard uh, Rich, this, this guy and his folks play some variation of, um, of the theme to All Things Considered. So without further ado, Rich Kleinfeld. Welcome. Well, hey, Rich. Yeah, it's how, good to be here. The magic, how about that for a few notes? <laughs> you know, I tell you, I'm embarrassed, you know, all this stuff. Oh, my gosh. We, well, we're just honored to have you tonight, Rich. Yeah. It's really. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to talk to somebody who has been both uh, in, in the field for a long time and also continues to be active. Uh, but as I always start with the question of, what is your earliest memory of understanding the music was going to be part of who you are as a human being? Wow. Um, I, I think before I even decided to play, um, I had a little crystal radio set. I had my own little microphone, a little uh, earpiece that I made and a crystal radio. And I was amazed the crystal radio kept playing all the time. You never had to have a battery or anything. It just kept playing. And I grew up near Chicago, and radio was, was just uh, the best there. So I put this little earpiece under my pillow, and I could go to bed each night listening to classical music, to jazz, and I just couldn't get enough of it. And I also fell in love with radio as well. So I had these sort of dual paths of music and, and broadcasting that uh, stayed with me for you know my whole life. And um, then I discovered that my father had played the saxophone. <laughs> and uh, he encouraged in a, in a very light way you know, that it might be fun to play saxophone. He'd already sold all of his things. My brother and I both used the same saxophone. My brother is four years older than I am. And so um, he would use it and then I would use it and then you know, we'd take turns and so forth. Uh, I always say that he was more talented than I was. I had to work harder. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did you grow up, Rich? In Mundelein, Illinois. It's um, north of Chicago, about 35 miles, uh, right near the Wisconsin border, not far from uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we, um, we used to have to take the train to go into the city. And my, mo my mother loved music. She'd always listen to the opera as a kid in Chicago. Um, she, would, uh, she grew up in the city. And um, the Auditorium Theater, which is a historic building there, she would go there. And finally, when I was in my 40s, I got to go to the very top where she had purchased her tickets in the auditorium theater during a tour. And I held onto that little railing where you don't fall, fall off the balcony because <laughs> you're so high. <laughs> probably probably seven, seven stories high or something. But the acoustics were fantastic. Wow. Um, and music was always a part in our house. So as early as I can remember, and we had a piano that I would hide under, you know, a, a, an old upright that was painted various colors depending on the walls in the house. You know. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Now, was it the U.S. Army that brought you to the D.C. area? 
And yes, and that was serendipity. Um, my lottery number, if you can all remember the draft in 1969. Young people looked that up. That's right. My lottery number was 60, 60 because of my birthday. If I'd been born four hours earlier, you know, it would have been 360, but it was 60. And I had a music teacher in college who said, you better practice. And she was much more pointed in her uh, <laughs> directness. <laughs> and there were some guys who knew about the army band here in Washington. And they said, this is a, a good gig. And, you know, come do your arm military time in the band. And mm -hmm. uh, I auditioned. Um, and that was another thing. I had auditions all over. But I didn't have one with the army band. And uh, the father of a, a former student friend who was already in the band, a trombone player, it, um, he had just retired with the band. And he said, why aren't you auditioning with the army band? And I said, I, I never heard back from them. And he called them and got me an audition and I got accepted. You know? Wow. And he said, you know, the administration office doesn't answer any letters. They're very bad. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we have some, some common friends, Joe, ha Joe and Larry Hodgen. Larry and yeah. I were like this, you know, yes. we came in about the same time. Uh, Larry on trumpet, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, remained fast friends and went bike riding for many years. And uh, we used to have, uh, Monopoly parties at Joe and Larry's um, on uh, Friday evenings, and we did so many concerts together. Um, and uh, you know, Larry and I, I think, both share this. You may get out of the band, but the band doesn't get get out of you. You know, you That's still right. you still continue to stay connected, and um, you know, it was it was just a, a tremendous experience. Yeah. Well. It's Speaking of connection and, and band, do you have something prepared to share with us? I do, uh, a couple of pieces. And I, I will say from the beginning, um, the saxophone is so well known as a jazz instrument. Um, it doesn't need any, any introduction or ex explanation. People know, you know, the, the, the saxophone in the jazz world. And when I was in college, uh, I had this naive attitude that if I became a classical tenor player, I would get plenty of work. <laughs> um, and, and I've had all that work. I can count it on five, you know, ten fingers, you know. Uh, but um, the quartet has just been the, the love of my life in terms of music. Um, the sax quartet here in Washington was a big deal in the 70s. Uh, in the army band, I was in one quartet, I was in another quartet, and another quartet. And one of them stuck. We started in 76. And as you said, George, in the beginning, uh, we're that quartet that plays on national public radio and all things considered. But the sound of the classical saxophone is something that people really rarely hear. And so I'm going to play a classical piece on, on tenor and then one on alto. And, Lovely. Uh, this first piece, um, I can take some liberties with it because it's for cello. Uh, it's, an, it's an unaccompanied cello piece from the third cello suite by Bach. Uh, Bach is just uh, a composer that all classical groups love, you know. So, um, and it's, um, it's unaccompanied, so it works really well on, on the saxophone. So. Wonderful. Okay. The screen is yours. Ladies Thank and you. gentlemen, Rich Kleinfeld. <laughs> Thank you. 
listening right now <laughs> i know he is oh that was yeah, lovely we, thank you very much we we make a joke in the quartet that uh, whenever we play um a piece by bach that was written maybe for uh keyboard and we transcribe it for four saxophones or you know one of his fugues or something and we always say uh, unfortunately he died in 1750 uh the saxophone was invented in 1840 so we never got a chance to meet but, <laughs> if, he, but if he were alive he would have written it for sax quartet so. <laughs> i love that that's yeah. fantastic yeah. well um so um explain to to me please the difference between the tenor and the alto sax besides the tone well um adolf sax when he invited invented the instrument there was someone called adolf sax that's right a belgian he he grew up in uh, dinant belgium and um he was the son of a, an instrument maker and so uh when he uh he was always tinkering and he decided to make an instrument that was made of brass and had a woodwind mouthpiece and the idea was to bridge the gap in the orchestra between the woodwinds and the brass and the strings that the saxophone would would sort of play a role in bringing all that sound to together and it would fit in very well. Um, some composers wrote for the saxophone early on in the 19th century, <clears throat> right after the instrument was invented, but it always turned out to be a solo instrument. And um, the idea that Adolf Sax had was to create an instrument that had the kind of flexibility uh, that the human voice has. And so your question, Jose Luis, about the sound of the saxophone, it can be raucous and wild as a jazz player or a rock band, all those storied, you know, solos where they just growl through that instrument. Um, but it can also be sweet and pretty in the classical sense. And the highest uh, saxophone was a sopranino, about this big. And then there was the soprano. And oh this one is straight. And they have a, as opposed to the tenor, it's an octave higher. So. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, the soprano, and it goes pretty high. And then uh, there's the alto, this one right uh, over here. The alto, which is um, an octave lower than the sopranino, which is that, that short saxophone. And then there's something called the, ten, uh, the C melody, or it, it didn't really take hold. Uh, but then there's the tenor, the baritone, the bass, and the contrabass. So seven in all. Wow. And it's sort, it's sort of like a choir of, of saxophones. And so when you put four of them together, uh, it really does sound like an organ or a brass group or a string group and so forth. So the length of the instrument, the bore, everything, that's what makes each one of them, you know, different. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, he... You know, he convinced some players in France, and it became wildly popular in the military bands. So, and is the one that you favorite the most? Uh... <laughs> you, you know, the tenor is closest to my heart. That's I, I convinced my teacher in college to major on tenor saxophone. <laughs> I know, um, as a classical player, that was just unheard of. What are you kidding? You know, there's no, there's not enough music. Uh, all of it's written for the alto. Yeah. Uh, but when I got to the army band, I remember calling a, a person that I that I had heard when I was in in uh, high school. Um, he was working on his graduate degree in college. Steve Evans is his name, and he was in the Marine Band by the time I got to the army band. So I called him up and I said, uh, "I'd like to study with you 
to work on my masters. And he said, well, you're not going to play the tenor. I know you're <laughs> <laughs> So I had to buy an alto, you know, oh. and, uh, and played alto in the army band mainly after, after the first few years, you know, I became the alto player. And uh, so it was, um, but you know, I, I, I love them all. Uh, it's just that the tenor is sort of like um, a vibration. You know, you feel that warmth. I, I wish I had been a cellist. That's what I. <laughs> that's what I really wanted. Well, and I certainly won't uh, want to use the analogy of, of people with children, like the favorite child. I won't. Oh, I won't I, even I say know. that. Right? You know, that's right. Right. Yeah. I have three boys, and and they're all very sweet. You know? They're they're wonderful. Yeah. Do any of them have the musical talents that you have? Um, you know, they all do in their own way. Um, I learned early on not to become a teacher of one of my kids, you know, so that didn't work well. Um, <laughs> but, they, you know, I, I drag them to concerts. I mean, we have a legendary story in the family about going to the St. Matthew Passion uh, by Bach. It's a three hour, you know, um, you know performance. And uh, I got tickets for the whole family because I'd interviewed um, Norman Scribner, who for many years was with the Choral Arts in town. And uh, yeah, Norman, right? And so um, <laughs> we go to the Kennedy Center and, and the kids were just teasing me all the time. You know, my oldest son said, can I get a T-shirt that says I survived the St. Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the middle one who's, you know, they're all in their 40s now, right? But the, the, and they thank me for that. But the middle, the middle one said, uh, do they have festival seating? It's just like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the youngest one would read the, the German and, and sort of fall asleep off and on, you know. But at any rate, the youngest one, who's now got a family of his own, he lives right here in, in uh, Northern Virginia. He plays drums in a rock band. And oh. uh, so he's still and he loves music and got a little keyboard for his um, his middle his um, oldest son who's now three uh, years old almost four um, the middle one lives in England and sang in a rock band and uh, worked in radio and knows music like the back of his hand these guys know music better than I do the pop music and so forth indie rock and all that and then the oldest one um, also got involved in radio but uh, new music but he didn't he didn't sing or play, but I'm sure he could have. You know, he was he was the athlete, you know, the, you know, the baseball player. But um, yeah, but they they have a love for music that we all share now. You know, and talk about. You know? That's yeah. wonderful. Oh, that's well, yeah. let's hear uh, some of the love that you now share for the alto sax. Okay. Well, this um, I'll get another neck strap here, and there's a story. You know, this this is a uh, halter strap that I use for the tenor. And uh -huh. the, reason, the reason I do that is because I had one of these for the tenor for many years and my neck was just killing me. Um, it was unbelievable how I was starting to bend over and walk. Funny. Yeah. You know, so um, I, I switched over to this halter strap some years ago and I'm glad I did because it's... Um, it's been very helpful. So it's this, ergonomic. That's right. It is. Um, this piece that I'm going to play here um, was written by a French composer, Maurice Ravel. And Ravel used the alto saxophone in his arrangement of the, uh, the orchestration of Pictures at an Exhibition by the Russian composer Modest Mussorgsky. And uh, it's a solo part that alto players um, who want to play with an orchestra usually get to play. And you play this solo in the third section or fourth section, and then you sit for the rest of the <laughs> performance. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you do nothing, you know. Um, but saxophonists who play classical music are always looking for transcriptions that work. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for music that we can... Um, that we can play that was written for something else. So this is the Pavan uh, for a dead princess, a beautiful piece for strings, for orchestra, for piano by Maurice Ravel. And um, I don't have the accompaniment here, but the melody itself 
as they say, speaks for itself. So I, w I will play this. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, thank you, guys. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for being here with us. And yeah. um, and I wanted to just do a little shout out to our friend Brian Alpert, on uh, the drummer, and also to Ann Tilson Coppola, my our beautiful sister. And Annie. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that's right. you know, uh, when you mentioned Wolf Trap, you know, I always think of Annie and I think of Joe, who's now retired, but, you know, sort of made things happen. Uh, she did. She was the one who um, actually uh, encouraged me to start the radio show way back when. Wow. Uh, it was now uh, 20 some years ago, you know, and the, and the recital series itself, too. So everybody is just so supportive there of classical music in the in the chamber series and uh, uh, the, the um, CEO now, uh, Arvin. Uh, is really visionary that's yeah. right you know and so joe um and larry still show up you know at the concerts and annie's there uh wearing her little name tag <laughs> <laughs> making everybody feel so welcome she always does she and is. really i want to say the wolf trap is is really stepped up this summer to bring the wolf trap opera company back in some really safe ways and i'm yes. and they're offering some free uh streaming uh, concerts. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, like so many uh, venues, they've just been, um, you know, torn apart and have to yeah. come up with, with, uh, with all sorts of inventive ideas. And, and uh, I think that that's just so, so special. I mean, in fact, um, I'm pointing over here, and, uh, it's kind of backwards on the screen, but it's my closet. And in that closet is my makeshift studio. And uh, we did center stage from Wolf Trap. I was in there and Leanne Mosleski, who uh, is the co-host of the radio program, was in her closet at her house in Vienna. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, it's, a, it's, it's amazing how much more technical and, and, and technology savvy artists now have to be to remain connected. That's true, a absolutely. and. Um, you know, you really, you really find out um, what what it takes to put something together online and, and do all that. I mean, it's just it's what you guys are doing is tremendous because it just takes a lot of forethought and technology and cooperation from people, and it's just it's just very you know 
very special and, and important. So. Well, thank you. I've been saying to folks all along that we have the essential workers who are the frontline workers and we have the grocery clerks and the delivery people who are frontline essential workers. And I am really believing that uh, artists of all stripes uh, are essential to this world and to uh, helping us get through this and not only helping us just to entertain us through it, but to help us solve problems to get through it. And so I really want to push a movement to bring artists in, pay artists to help teachers figure out how to get kids educated while they're hunkered down. Do you know, um, I, I am a big advocate of STEAM. Mm -hmm. um, you know, STEM schools are uh, science, technology, um, and something in math engineering and math, but STEAM is the arts. And, yes. you know, the A there, that it's so critical. Um, the, one of the best high school bands and orchestras is the Thomas Jefferson Technology School. That's right. Where Jose so, Luis's sister Carolina graduated from. That's right, right yeah. yeah. And they are just, you know, they're bright. And I think, you know, music, I encourage my students that I teach to think about the thought process and how important it is to make decisions in music in time, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can say from the heart, I still get nervous every time, you know, playing for you guys with, whoo, you know, <laughs> and after all these years. And I have to, you know, think about all this stuff. And my colleagues are the same way. I mean, the quartet, having been together for 40 some years, um, rehearsing every Monday night, except for the last three months or so, um, we still share that. You have to really think and make decisions in time, you know, and music's like that, you know. It's, it's fantastic. Absolutely. And we con will continue to be, and we'll continue to be what keeps us alive and connected. And, and Rich, so thank you so, so much. And, and please give Katrina our best, would you? Okay, I will, and, I will. And, um, and stay on, so we'll chat after we hang up here. Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in, and we will see you tomorrow for another edition of the Music Connection. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me.